Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA Network Plus certification training course, the online training course that's a powerful cleaner with that great orange scent. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about common security threats. This is the last module of our Network Plus requirements from N10-004, Section 6.6, .6, where we need to identify common security threats and mitigation techniques. So we're going to talk about all kinds of ways that people get into your network, gain access to your systems, and we're also going to talk about the ways you can prevent those things from happening to begin with. Let's talk about some of the common security threats out there. One common one that you see a lot these days is denial of service. A denial of service is anything that happens to a device that prevents it from providing normal services. In some ways, there can be denials of service that are technology-based. There can be denials of service that are physical-based. If I cut the power to a building, that is essentially a denial of service. If I find a vulnerability to a server that hangs up the operating system, that's also a denial of service. So a, a DOS can take many different forms. There's also something called a DDOS, or a distributed denial of service. If we don't have physical access to the electricity, maybe we take one machine and we have it start hitting a server as hard as it can. We start just requesting a lot of things. Then we have another machine somewhere else do the same thing. Then we have a third machine do exactly the same thing. Then we have a hundred more machines, a thousand more machines, a hundred thousand more machines start accessing a server all at the same time. That is a distributed denial of service. We can't just turn off one IP address and get rid of our problem. These days, the botnets that are out there are designed to be a distributed denial of service among many other things. And it's, a, it's amazing what people have done to be able to take over that many devices on the internet and have them do their bidding whenever they'd like. One very common and, and very old style of denial of service that we used to see out there was something called a Smurf attack. And it, this was called a Smurf attack um, when we saw that somebody was sending a specialized ping message to an, a broadcast address. This is something that doesn't work anymore. We've changed the way that ping works. We've changed the way that routers work. But if a router saw a ping that was going to a broadcast address, it would duplicate that ping to everybody on the network. So you essentially would send one packet in, and if there were 200 people on the network, boom, you just sent that one packet to 200 people without having to send it out 200 times. People were doing denial of service, love that, that's easy. I'll just send 10 packets in, and all of a sudden I just sent 200 packets, 10,000 10, packets, 20,000 packets. Very simple now just to send a lot of packets in and have them duplicated automatically by the infrastructure devices that were supposed to be protecting the network. So you don't see this anymore. We fixed that one in 1999. But it's one way that we can think back and say that was one way that we were using these attacks to be able to bring down networks, and we call that a Smurf attack. A problem that everyone deals with is viruses and worms. So let's talk about what is a virus and what is a worm. A virus is a bit of bad code, a bit of code that somebody has created to do bad things on your system that infects the system by using the files and the documents that already reside on your system. And the way they get somewhere else is you copy that file to somebody and the virus is copied along with it. And then as long as that person on the other side opens the document or runs that file, then they also now have the virus and it can then hop somewhere else. That's a little different than a worm. A worm doesn't need your documents. He doesn't need your files. A worm simply gets into an operating system and then can hop around to another operating system using the network that's already connecting everything together. And that's why when we have these big outbreaks, we always talk about the worms that are on our networks that are now outbreaked and they're going everywhere. And they're that pervasive because they don't need you. They only need the network and then they can hop around as much as they'd like. If we ever want to refer to all of these things in a more generic term, we can use the term malware. We've The term malware has become sort of a catch-all to mean viruses, adware, spyware, worms, anything else that might be bad on a network, we oftentimes refer to as malware. So if you hear any of those terms, either a virus or worm or malware, that's what it's referring to. Another way that bad guys get into the network and are able to eavesdrop on what's going on is an attack called a man-in-the-middle attack. And this is used a lot 
when there is encrypted communication, but it can be done just as easily, in fact, easier when the communication is not encrypted. The way this works is that normally two stations would be communicating to each other. They'd be talking to each other or they'd be sending their private, their, their public keys to each other. They would be sending encrypted messages to each other. And normally that would be a very private communication. If somebody was to sit in the middle of that communication and retrieve the keys they're sending to each other and send along their own key as a replacement, they can now sit in the middle and look at all of the encrypted communication, simply decrypt it in the middle, re-encrypt it and send it on its way and be able to examine everything that's sent back and forth. Now you can start to see why a man in the middle attack is a bad thing. Now, fortunately, it's not something that scales very well. It's hard to get in the middle of every single conversation. But if you find the right conversation, you're able to really take advantage of man in the middle, you can gather a lot of interesting information. Here's a problem that can bring your network security right down to its knees, something called a rogue access point. Rogue access points are problematic because they're very inexpensive. A rogue access point is nothing more than just an access point that's in a network where it shouldn't be. And you can go out to lunch, go pick up an access point. Why not? Bring it back to the office, plug it in. Just plug it in with the default configuration. In fact, many access points these days are starting to turn on more encryption by default, but it's very easy to take an existing access point, plug it into the network, and now you've just extended your wired network into the wireless realm. And if somebody's in your parking lot and this wireless access point has not been configured with your security requirements, they now have access to your internal network and they didn't have to do anything. It's a huge security hole. They just got around all your remote access capabilities, all your user authentication to the network capabilities, everything that you had on the edge of your network, they just jumped right over and went right into this access point, all from this $20 device they happened to pick up during lunchtime. This is a big problem, and usually what security people will do is they'll take a scanner of some kind that looks at those frequencies, and they'll walk around the building. And they're making sure the only access points they see are the ones that they put in the network. Social engineering is a very crafty security problem because it usually takes many different forms. There's no specific social engineering thing I can look for. And it is all based on people communicating with other people. Somebody might call you and say, hi, this is James from the help desk. And I've, I'm looking through some things that are on your file server. And we had to rebuild a lot of things last night. I need to create your permissions and access to your spreadsheets. Please give me your username and password and I'll make sure that your account is updated with the rights and permissions that it should have. If I was to get that username and password, I'd now have access to that part of the network all by just asking somebody for it. And you'd be surprised how easy that is. Cannot detect this electronically. There's nothing, no device I can put on the network that's going to stop social engineering. And usually this takes a place of a weird phone call. It takes the place of somebody showing up at the door. I'm here to fix your copier. I mean, steal your stuff. One of those types of things. Very suspicious. So make sure you look out for people you don't recognize in your work environment. They have visitor badges. Uh, if they don't have a visitor badge, ask them, hey, do you have your badge on you? I need to check and make sure that you're supposed to be in here. There should be processes in place for these things. And people need to know that this is how you stop social engineering is by shining a light on them and letting all the roaches run back under where they're supposed to go then. Get out of your network, get out of your environment and stop calling your people. A very, very easy way to gather personal information these days is through a methodology called phishing. This is essentially an electronic version of social engineering. What if you got this email from Bank of America? Oh, it's an online banking alert saying that the primary email address for my online banking has been changed. Well, I may want to have a look at that and how nice they put a link right here that says I could sign into my online banking and click on the customer service tab to see what's going on there. Great. Let me click on that. The screen that comes up at that point is exactly the same as Bank of America's login page, except it's not Bank of America's login page. It's on a different server. And as soon as you put in your username and password, that person now has access to your bank account. And now from that point, they go to town. They'll clean you out. And now you have to go through pro fraud protection. Don't ever click on any of those links inside an email. Don't even trust anything that you get in an email. You can look at this, this email that came through. That looks completely legitimate. They've even got the, this is from 90, uh, 2004. They even have the Olympic logo on the screen. 
just like a Bank of America email might be. Don't trust anything you get electronically. Pick up the phone. Give Bank of America a call. Ask them directly. Those types of things can help you and prevent anybody from going in and cleaning out your bank account just because they were able to fish out of you that personal information. Well, the bad guys are good, but they can be stopped. We can stop them by putting in some mitigation techniques, things like policies and procedures. Policies and procedures sounds very boring, but it's very, very important. We need to have processes so that everybody in the organization knows how we do security. And if you stop one security breach, it will be worth the time, effort, and money that you put into putting together policies and procedures for this. They need to be very visible. People need to have access to be able to read them. If the network goes down, if somebody does get control of your systems, it needs to be printed out. There's this thing called paper, and you can put them together into something called a notebook, and you can put that on a shelf. And that way, people, they ever want to know, what, what should we be doing? What is the policy for this? Let's pull it out, flip to that page. Now we know exactly what to do, who to call, what, what procedures we should have in place. Should we unplug anything? Should we have something ready? Should the government and step in the door. There's a lot of different policies and procedures depending on who you are and what you do. The policies and procedures, by the way, are never done. They are a living document. They are always undergoing change, primarily because there's always opportunities to make them better. And we're also finding ways that the bad guys are finding new technologies and new ways to get into your network. So you have to have new policies and new procedures to keep up with all of those new ways that they're finding to get access to your data. Another very important piece is training your users. There's a few ways that you can go about doing this. And I go into different environments all the time. There's signs on the board. There are posters in the middle of the hallway as you're walking through. Ask people if they don't have a visitor badge. Make sure you don't let somebody walk in behind you when you badge in through the door. Make sure these messages are always changing. Make sure they're very visible. You can also send email to people. Email generally doesn't get seen very well, so it's probably not your first step for educating people. Sometimes people will reference back through their emails, and at least you're getting some eyeballs on the type of problem. The message boards out when somebody gets off of the elevator right in front of you as a message board Always have some security features, some security updates, some tips and tricks there for your user training. And always keep them moving around on that physical message board that they might see when they walk in the office first thing in the morning. When the login message is another way that you might get messages out to people, the problem is that they almost become invisible to people after a while. They stop looking at them because they know they rarely change. So probably, again, about like email, not a great way to get in touch with people. And internet pages are always a good place to put your security policies as a reference point to make sure you see something on your message board. Check the internet for more information about how we should handle visitors inside of our building. Another way that everybody is trying to keep up with these security problems is patching the holes that are in our operating systems and our applications. And we have to keep up to date all the time with these patches. These will resolve these issues. They'll make sure your systems are more stable. And they'll certainly keep out the bad guys if we can patch those holes as quickly as possible. It's very common to see these these days. We know that Microsoft comes out with patches every month. Sometimes they come out with patches even in the middle of the month. So make sure that all of your systems are updated with the latest security patches. You may save yourself a big headache later on. These patches, by the way, never end. They're constantly flowing through. There's always updates to applications, always updates to operating systems. You always have to stay at least ahead of what's going on. And that can be a challenge because in large environments, you have to get the patch. You have to put it on a server. You have to test it. What if that patch breaks something and the thing that it breaks is what you do as your business? You can't afford that. You have to test them. So there has to be a process in place as soon as you get the patch, how you're going to test it and how you're going to roll that patch out becomes very important. Make sure you have policies and procedures to be able to handle that. Let's see what we've learned in our Common Security Threats module. Our first question, what can prevent a device from providing normal services? What could possibly cause a problem there? Well, it would be a denial of service or even a distributed denial of service. Our second question, what method can hackers use to intercept encrypted communications between stations? And between stations is the really important part there. It's the man in the middle attack where they're able to sit in between and see everything that's going back and forth. And lastly, what electronic hoaxes gather personal information? We saw an example of one of those, and that would be phishing. Well, that concludes this module, section 6.6, .6, where we've looked at both security threats 
and mitigation techniques. We have an entire Network Plus certification training online for free. Come watch any of our videos, participate in our message boards, and much more. Visit our website, freenetworkplus.com.